to uh, our next speaker. Um, to introduce our next speaker, I'm going to invite the government, uh, the Quebec government delegation in Chicago. Mr. Uh, Dominic Tetu is Director of Economic uh, Affairs at the Quebec office in Chicago. He has kindly come to visit us from Chicago just for this event. Uh, his government office recently joined Global Minnesota as a corporate member because they have some economic development goals for companies in their territory. And we're having a lot of fun just getting acquainted. It's only been about six weeks, but we have an immediate opportunity to share a story coming from Montreal. And I will invite uh, Dominique to introduce our next speaker. <laughs> Thank you so much, Steve. Uh, yeah, our office is based out of Chicago, covers 12 states in the Midwest region. Uh, it's part of a network of 10 offices in the U.S., 37 offices worldwide. Uh, we've been established back in 1969, and our main purpose is really to promote Quebec's interest in areas of uh, common benefit, including, obviously, economic development, as you mentioned, Steve, but uh, water, sustainability, renewable energy, those are very hot topics for, uh, for Quebec and at their top of mind. So that's why we're so excited to engage with the community of Global Minnesota. Thank you, Phil. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Cargill, for receiving us. Uh, we're very excited to get this first uh, initiative with Global Minnesota on the topic of water and to be able to have Martin Bureau, who uh, heads the PFAS Center of Excellence at Altra. Uh, Martin is a uh, uh, a real uh, industry expert, uh, graduated in engineering back in 1992, uh, PhD in uh, materials science back in 1997, a long uh, career at the National Research Council of Canada, and now uh, heading ultra uh, uh, initiatives to, to tackle such important challenges as uh, water issues for cities, for uh, obviously municipalities, companies. So very excited to uh, to listen to Martin. Welcome, the floor is yours, Martin. And thank you again, Steve, Phil, and Global Minnesota. Testing my sound, okay, not bad. Well, it's uh, it's an honor to be with you today. First, uh, first uh, opportunity at the uh, MN Global. Um, we are uh, based in Minnesota, believe it or not. We operate a landfill leachate treatment plant that strictly deals with the PFAS at the local uh, landfill sites just south of Minneapolis. It's called SKB Rosemont. And uh, it's operated by the third of the industry, probably, uh, Waste Connections. And uh, they're partnering with us over there. It's the first uh, such uh, facility in North America. Uh, and we're really glad to be the first on the market and addressing, addressing it uh, like uh, on a daily basis. Um, Eder gave a great introduction and you, sir, asked a few questions that I'm going to address. So I'm glad that, uh, that you did. We're here to talk about water resiliency. Uh, the, the, work, the climate is changing. There's a new context. Eder talked about this. I'll, I won't elude too much about it, but uh, let me just complete what she said. Uh, I had more notes, but uh, so we have a lot of water where we have 25% of the fresh water of the world around the Great Lakes. But, and we take comfort into that, but we only have about 3% of the renewable resource of water in that area because all of that is going to the oceans. So while we have a lot, it's not because of that that we should waste it. And you know about the state of uh, Lake Erie, for example. That's uh, a great example of uh, things, uh, well, places where we need, uh, we need to do better. And uh, Lake Superior, of course, due, due to its size, has less uh, of those issues, but uh, they're all at risk. Um, this winter, 25% of the continental U.S. were in drought. So we... It's not true that we have access to water that much. In August 23, 22 million people in this country didn't have access to water, period. That, that's, that's huge. Um, and at the same time, California or, so, or Southern uh, Texas didn't have access, uh, had uh, drought, uh, flooding, sorry. So it's, uh, it's, a, it's a complex situation. Uh, Minnesota last Christmas, not this one, but the one before, 
add uh, tons of rain and then droughts, and uh, and then you add the uh, uh, a very dry and warm and slow less slow less uh, winter this uh, this winter, so it, it's all changing. Last winter, uh, last summer, sorry, you had uh, all our smoke from Canada because of the fires. I mean, it, some of those fires are still going on under under the ground. They are not put out yet, and they will re uh, start again. So it's it's really an intense uh, uh, situation. And we're at the pivot. That crisis is a, <clears throat> is a water crisis. A few facts uh, uh, preparing that talk. One uh, is striking. Uh, the water-related disasters account for more than 90% of the four trillion US dollars <clears throat> in economic losses that uh, we experience in this country over the last 50 years. Four trillion, I don't even know what that means. Uh, shortage of drought are uh, exacerbating the, uh, the, the state of our water infrastructure. Uh, Canada and, and the US, it's the same. There's uh, two trillion gallons of water that are being lost every day in this country. 10% uh, <clears throat> more in Canada, I guess. 15% of your drinking water that treated water is lost. Uh, that's the na national average. I was able to find Wisconsin statistics, not Minnesota. It's uh, it's 15 percent. Uh, sorry, it's 20 percent. It's high. It's very high. 20 percent of the pipe need to be changed. Current now, not not 50 years from now. Now, um, in a single day in July 22. Houston has a, had a thousand water main break, one thousand, because they have a, a very um, uh, a very intense drought, and they have that kind of soil. It's a clay soil that tends to subside uh, very, very much, and as a result, uh, all those uh, w uh, you know old pipes that were damaged uh, broke. One thousand. That's the whole budget of this uh, this fellow, Mr. Johnson, director of water that goes that day for all his network. He has no more money for the rest of the year. It's really, it's really <laughs> amazing. What else? I could go on forever, but uh, I said the point. Um, we have emerging contaminants, but we have old contaminants as well. 20, more than 20 million people in this country still uh, rely on lead lines for their, for their uh, water. Uh, there is no safe level uh, for lead in your water, especially for pregnant water, uh, women, for example, or uh, infants. And the PFAS situation, and I believe everyone knows about PFAS, forever chemicals. Uh, if, uh, you know, some companies here have used it, other states have as well. Uh, Minnesota is kind of uh, at the heart, or one of the hearts, if I can say. Uh, of this thing, but North Carolina is as well. Maine, due to their biosolid use of PFAS, is another. Um, the PFAS situation is making things uh, even worse because the EPA and the local states are actually right now addressing that issue, and, and we don't know exactly how it's going to cost. And, and you see the numbers there, they're insane. I mean, way too big for anyone to address it. So there's a bit of denial at this point. I, I was at the Global Waste Management Symposium two weeks ago, and one of the keynotes was actually kind of making jokes on how bad could this be since it's so big. Like, uh, and it made me think of that uh, movie, uh, Don't Look Up, really, uh, the, same, the same attitude. So uh, definitely there's something to be done, and it's too big for us to, like you, me, and you, to uh, do it alone. So there's a, a lot to be done. I'll cut on the statistics, but only one. Um, replacing all those pipes in this country and Canada is, is just not an option. There is no iron pipes or PVC pipes or polyethylene pipes just to change it, period. We don't, enough we don't have enough time. We don't, we don't have enough manpower as well. So that is demanding for new solutions. It's not a matter of, of, of choice. It's a matter of when we'll make those decisions. So that's a, a, big, uh, a, big, important, a big important factor. 
Two slides borrowed from the American Waterworks Association and the Bluefield Research, their uh, think tank in Boston that uh, are doing great work. I must say I'm a, I'm a big fan of what they do. Um, this is uh, on one side the water main infrastructure by region in age. So obviously, West Coast is younger than the, the Midwest or the East Coast, I believe. And you see, uh, you know, uh, with navy blue and uh, middle blue, uh, uh, you know, the age of the infrastructure. Uh, let me remind you that um, the uh, light blue is still 31 to 60 years old. So in some region, for example, a small city uh, on the Montreal island, they've built uh, everything in the 70s. It's uh, ductile iron pipe, like typical pipe. You have the same here. It's all corroded. It's all, it's all dead. Why? Because of that soil that they have, plus the climate that we have. Lots of water, uh, free star cycles and everything. So it's going to hell uh, currently. And it's not even 50 years. So 30 to 60 years is actually uh, past uh, the design life for many uh, uh, infrastructures. Another point, uh, the water loss. Uh, California, uh, Georgia, uh, this is difficult data to get. Um, try to find the leaks from Los Angeles uh, Department of Water and Power. That is absolute taboo. Like, you can't have it. Um, it's below 10, but it's above 5. And it's, it's an unthinkable amount of water for them to be uh, uh, publicly uh, uh, you know, disclosing. So it's, it's a big thing. So I won't point fingers at, uh, at any state here, but we're all in this. Uh, 20, uh, Montreal used to have up to 60%, 60% of, uh, of its water loss. Of course, we've got plenty, so who cares? Uh, that was the attitude, but in the 90s, now we're down to 26, which is very good, but it's way too much uh, in a way. So there's a, a lot to, that needs to be done. That's the infrastructure state, then the water quality state. Um, uh, like I said, 14 to 28 billion of drinking water remediation technology use in, in the coming years. Uh, and it's, it has started new technologies for lead, uh, lining uh, lead lines, for example, or treating PFAS, or uh, you know, protecting uh, um, uh, systems from uh, other emerging contaminants. Let's think of uh, arsenic, for example. And um, so lots of money, lots of new technology, and I'll talk about the funding from the federal government. But there's only a handful of states that have actually clearly stated what they want to do and their priorities. Uh, Minnesota is one of them. Uh, Wisconsin is following. Uh, and then you have uh, New York and a few others. But uh, while California is doing uh, you know, a lot of uh, regulation, they're actually doing extremely little currently on their infrastructure. Uh, and especially on the contaminant of emerging concern uh, front. So that, you know, regulation can be a good thing, but it could be also uh, Edwin's. Uh, and in California, uh, I can testify because we, we operate in California. It's very, very complex. And as I said, the, the PFAS uh, situation is bringing a level of, of complexity to the situation that uh, <clears throat> and opportunities that uh, that uh, that is quite overwhelming. Um, there's the uh, the investment uh, uh, the infrastructure investment job act that will provide funding. Uh, it actually started, but if you look at the statistics, it's actually looked at. Uh, uh, states are filing, but they they're actually using quite little. Uh, I don't remember, but I have all those numbers, but it's a, it's a fraction of the, um, the money that's available. And I was in a city close to uh, Minneapolis uh, yesterday, and uh, the mayor was telling me how difficult it is to apply for those funds. And he's got like something like 40% overhead on the funding that he gets just to handle the damn thing. So filing, reporting, it's crazy. And he doesn't have the amount of power. That's a 50 to 100,000 people community. So lots of goodwill, of course, and we recognize that, but um, not simple. Out of that uh, gigantic fund, 10% is dedicated to the water infrastructure. 
Uh, the vast majority goes to the, the regular state revolving fund for traditional work in infrastructure. Then you've got the emerging contaminants that is taking a, a lot of attention for good reasons. And, uh, and lead services. Now, it relies still on digging and replacing. And a, a, a fun fact, or, or a crazy fact, perhaps not fun, people lose track of that lead. Where is that lead going? There's thousands and thousands of lead lines that disappear. There's a black market for lead lines. That's crazy. Yeah, yeah, there's, there's no custody of those lead lines. They just, so where do they go? I don't know, but I know that uh, when we do, we're being, uh, those lines are being uh, uh, stolen. And they, and they just disappear. So handling lead lines just by replacement is, is cumbersome, it's long, it's expensive. Plus, uh, what do you do with the lead? Uh, you'll have to recuperate it. So I guess that traces a portrait uh, both uh, positive and challenging and uh, uh, frightening at the same time. And that's our, our mission at, uh, at Senexen, Ultra Senexen, I should say. Uh, we deal with a lot of things created 40 years ago. I'm not here to talk too much about us, but we're, we're today relying on uh, talking about water main renewal and PFAS removing solution. If I have time, I see time flying. Um, let's skip that. The, the idea is to present an example. We've done, we've done 1,500 miles of water main renewal so far, more than any company uh, in North America uh, combined. And the idea is not to uh, replace replacement, because sometimes you need to open those streets, you need to renew everything. But when you don't need that, then there are solutions to just uh, renew from within. This is a trenchless technology. You don't open the street, and then you, you line. Uh, and you see two examples. One was a picture taken in Montreal. It could have been taken here. And you know that project last, we have got uh, intense winters. Uh, that project lasted three summers. The number of bankruptcy on those uh, businesses is, was 70%, 70. So very, very bad. Now it looks good, though. I mean, it, it, it recuperated, but uh, it's, it's intense. It's extremely expensive. Uh, and the other picture is a job we did, on, uh, we did on the California coast. And we're actually changing, renewing a pipe 500 feet long in a single shot in a day. And you, you, you don't see two access pits that are about eight feet by eight feet. You dig in the ground and then you repair from within. You see one truck that receives uh, the equipment that we, that we pull and, and another that you don't see because it's much smaller. And uh, so our purpose here is to help uh, utilities, municipalities to uh, achieve their, the, the, their targets, which would be if you're lucky, 100 years replacement, so 1% per year, without the impact. So that's the, the whole idea. I won't go to the detail because of time, but uh, this is trenchless. It's not sewer, it's water. You access your line, you clean it, you inspect it, you line it, and then uh, uh, you, uh, you return it to service. The big interest here, and it has tons of implications, including greenhouse gas, is uh, that it's more productive, of course. A single crew, well-trained, could do two mile, uh, one mile a week, typically. One mile of replacement per week. Uh, if you had uh, water, water works in your street, you know that it lasted four months. Uh, and it was, what, 500 feet or, or not even? So it's, uh, you, know, you, you see the, the, the economy of scale. So some cities are adapting that. Of course, it was uh, created uh, by a, a large corporation in the States, and then, uh, but they, they were doing only sewer. We decided to do water. We uh, launched that in Montreal, then Toronto. Toronto is actually the largest mar market on earth for uh, water main renewal. But uh, Chicago, Boston, other areas are doing a lot of that, but not nearly enough. We're actually addressing only 1% of the market of infrastructure replacement, 1%. The big, big pie is for the sidewalk guy and the asphalt guy and the dig guy and the, you know, you know, you understand the, so that's a, that's a, that's a, a challenge. I won't talk about the product. 
it's of course uh, you know designed to the standards that we need it will sustain the pressures it's safe it's NSF tested and whatnot you see a it's a woven product so you see a circular uh, loom so you see the aspect of that fabric we impregnate it into a resin that's not in contact with the water it becomes rigid like a composite for those who ski very close to your skis and it becomes extremely strong and resilient trying to uh, penetrate the uh, the uh, californian market we were told you got to show that it's going to survive an earthquake because u.s pipes or kubota or whatever uh, that's what they did and so we went to the place they go cornell university uh to to test that so we did a not going to go through the two years testing but the 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 climax of that whole thing was that split basin uh tests where you you have a big sandbox you bury a pipe and you shear it and uh, you look whether it's going to break or not and um if it works i didn't check so what we did is we, we tested it. Uh, so that's two years of work and then the final test. That's a $1 million test. And, um, and we're going to full extension. You'll see the side of the, the basin are moving and eventually they'll align. That's because the Cornell guys were not able to break that pipe and it's the first time it ever happened. Well, the point here, this is not black magic. This is a, a material that takes heavy the formation without damage like your skis so of course you know a, a a steel pipe or an iron pipe can't behave that way and against an earthquake they will break whereas we don't so it's it's just you know fundamental uh, material science okay i'll cut the long story but we tested the material it was not damaged the pipe in, in which it was lined was completely broken but the material inside survived and it was pristine. And conclusion by the seismicology expert at Cornell concluded that this was going to survive the next big one uh, in California and it would have survived uh, Christchurch events in, uh, in uh, New Zealand. We had uh, 20,000 feet of uh, 12 inch pipe in Anchorage and none were broken. Although I, we are still working on reports about that, but none were broken in the impacted area. But the story besides the, the, the technology is this. After 20 years of water main lining at a small suburban community in Montreal, they've replaced, um, I forgot to change the kilometers to miles. I don't see them anymore. So 160 miles, about 60 miles replacement so far, uh, and 48, if I recall correctly, miles of VAR material into that whole thing. But the point is that more than, or about uh, half of the whole network, it's a small network, uh, 160 miles, very small, but they replaced half of it. And over the years, they reduced their number, one, their number of water main breaks by 78%. And to this day, they have had no water main breaks into replaced sections. So this is a, a clear, productive, and there's competition, by the way, we're not the only product, that, um, that can provide solution for cities to uh, achieve their target. San Francisco, where we did pilots, sizable pilots, has an objective of 25 miles per year of replacement. You can't do 12 because they don't have the manpower, they can't get the contract out. They don't have the time to do those projects. So we told them, continue doing what you were doing and we'll do the rest. We'll open the rest for bids. We'll reach that 25 easy. Uh, you know, each project that Montreal or Toronto has is typically five to 10 miles per project. One project, we, we complete the whole deal. And San Francisco has a lot of needs, I can tell you. On top of that, obviously, you've got a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. Compared to open cut, it's 84% reduction. And that's uh, you know, vetted by uh, e economists that uh, the government authorities, we didn't calculate that. It's, it's the real numbers from them. So our 1,500 miles so far have, um, have had a, as impacts to reduce 50, uh, 562 kilotons of greenhouse gas. Uh, 
1.6 million trucks that are not on the road because they don't dig or backfill the roads. And I can guess, uh, you can guess the amount of fuel that was uh, saved. So there's a, the idea here that there's a lot of, uh, of added value at looking technologies, uh, subsidizing cities to start their project, their pilot project. And uh, I was going to say, think about uh, outside the box. Well, for them, yes, because they've never made a project like that. But, uh, but many others have. So uh, the community effect is, is very important here. And I believe I'm uh, out of time. So I'll just say this, as I said in the introduction, we just installed a clean water as a service PFAS contract. This is just uh, in your backyard at the Rosemount landfill. You have a picture of the facility. Um, it's operating as we speak. It treats 25 million gallons per year of, uh, of uh, leachate. We offer a guaranteed treatment. So we not only are we treating it and not paid if we don't treat it right, but we're paying damages if we don't. So we are guaranteeing that solution. Uh, I'll skip this and I'll go to the water for thought. Excuse me. Uh, so technology is not the problem. Uh, guys like me develop things all the time, and probably there are many in the rooms as well. So we're kind of uh, trying to find a, a problem to our solution. So the problem needs to be defined way more than it is actu actually. Um, and it needs to be incentivized. Like you, you need to, to do more of that. But climate change is changing the equation right now. It's calling the shot. You know, federal government here, Quebec, Canada are doing a lot. And uh, so the question is, are we driving the right decision? Let's not use uh, yesterday's solution for today and tomorrow problem. Uh, the community effect is very important. We are in this together, like legislators, professors, future workforce and, and brains, um, all of us. To, uh, to develop solutions for, uh, for the challenges that we are, uh, that we have, uh, that we are facing. And, uh, and that will create new solutions. Uh, for example, uh, the, um, the, uh, the, well, a, a, a great one. I, as a specialist, don't think that natural gas is, is you know, the solution for energy crisis. But renewable natural gas is there anyway. And it's a marvelous story to be told. And uh, the mayor of La Crosse had a, a LinkedIn uh, uh, posting a few weeks back that I saw, and he was proud to show his, his methane recuperation station. And that, that, that is wonderful. So he's, create, he's reducing his cost, he's reducing the uh, emissions of methane, and, uh, and uh, he's actually uh, uh, using that for fueling his fleets and, and so on. So that'll come, that, we'll see a lot of that. Uh, and I could go on forever, but I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Martin. When we have a pothole in our streets,